Welcome back to the Return to Base podcast. This episode, I'm talking to Scott Deluzio, an Army veteran and the author of the book, Surviving Son. He's also the host of the Drive On podcast, which I got an opportunity to be on a couple months ago. A little bit of a warning. On this episode, we're going to go into some pretty graphic detail about combat operation and firefights in Afghanistan. So if that's something that you don't think you're up for today, then go ahead and skip it. We have a lot of great content on veteranlife.com. Uh, and if you do skip it, we'll see you in a couple of weeks with the next episode. Bravo Zulu, this is Victor Lima. We are RTB. This is Return to Base, a Veteran Life podcast. Welcome back to the Return to Base podcast. Today, we got a great guest. Scott Deluzio is an Army National Guard veteran, OEF veteran, if, if I'm not mistaken. He's also the host of the Drive On podcast, which I had the honor and privilege to uh, record with him not too long ago. And he's also the author of a new book, Surviving Son. I get all that right, Scott? You got it all right. Yeah. And you even got the name right, which... Uh... A lot of Deluzio? people have trouble with the names. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> yeah, I've actually served with a couple of Deluzio, so uh, I guess it's in it's in my vernacular. How's it been going, Scott? Yeah, it's been great. Uh, yeah, since since the last time we talked, uh, lots lots happened uh, the, with the book coming out uh, about a, uh, back at the uh, end of August. Um, it it really is kind of taken off, and it, it's really been a uh, kind of a whirlwind uh, after that that book came out so i'm, I'm sure. really excited to to be here and, and to to talk about that and you know other stuff too yeah excellent and and i mean your book came out kind of at a interesting time with the united states leaving afghanistan it's almost like it was made to come out at that time we'll, we'll get into the book and all but yeah. i know that the, the interest was peaked at least for anything related to Afghanistan, anything related to service. So it came out at the right time and, and hopefully, and I know that you're having success, but I, I hopefully it'll continue. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. And it's, you know, it's been a great ride so far. I'm just, I'm, I'm hoping it, it continues. So we'll see. Great. great. So Scott, a little bit of background about yourself. I know you were in the army national guard. You want to kind of give us a brief overview of, of where you served, how you served and, and what brought you to where you are now. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so my brother and I, uh, growing up, we, we were raised in a very patriotic family. You know, there's videos of us as kids where we would, uh, be holding American flags and singing the national anthem and, and all that kind of stuff before we could even really get the words out. Like we were, we're you know, was that, that young. Um, and, you know, I remember as kids, we, we would go, uh, when the troops are coming back from desert storm, we went up to, uh, an air force base near us and, uh, and we, we greeted the troops coming back home, uh, from over there and it, that they were our superheroes back then. It wasn't like Superman or, you know, whatever it, it was like the, the soldiers, the military, the police and, and things like that. That's who we, we looked up to and that's who we respected. <laughs> And so fast forward a few years, I'm, I'm in college, uh, when nine 11 happened and, um, you know, that just really, it really pissed me off. And I think like a lot of Americans, we, we were really pissed off at what had happened. And, you know, I, um, I had considered like right then and there just dropping out of school and joining the military, but I, I was already a couple of years in and, um, you know, I figured, you know, I'm, I'm close enough to, to just getting out, you know, sometimes the hardest thing to, to do is starting something. And, and if you stop it and then try to start it again, you probably aren't going to do it. So I said, okay, I'm already here. This war is not going to be a, a quick in and out like desert storm was. So, you know, let me stay in, get my, my degree and I'll, I'll at least finish that. I'll have that behind me. Um, and during that time, uh, right around the time that I, I was getting out of school, my brother started going to uh, a military college up in Vermont, uh, Norwich University. And uh, he met a, a couple of guys there who were already in the National Guard. And and so he was like, you know, what? that sounds cool. I, I want to do that, too. So um, so he was already he was a cadet in you know the ROTC up there. And, and so he already had a little bit of the military kind of background with the training that they do there. But um, he decided to enlist in the, in the National Guard. He went infantry and um, 
And so I was, you know, growing up in this patriotic family, you know, the reason why I gave you the backstory of like how we, we grew up, I was like over the moon. I, I was so right. proud of him. And I, I was just so, you know, thrilled that he made that kind of decision, especially during a time of war when, right. you know, most, most soldiers were getting deployed, you know, especially in the combat arms, um, you know, even national guard were getting deployed. And so he knew there was a very real possibility he'd get deployed, uh, you know, shortly after uh, enlisting. And so, you know, that I was just extremely proud of that. But then, uh, I don't know, six, nine months later, um, I started hearing these reports on the news that the army was struggling to meet their recruiting numbers for this was probably 2005 or so. Right. And right about the first surge, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which it totally makes sense. But it pissed me off because I was like, why? Why are uh, they struggling to, to meet their numbers. Where are all those people from September 12th who are ready to move mountains to go, you know, get some payback? Uh, you know, where were all those people? And then I had a good long, hard look in the mirror and I said to myself, you know, what? I am those people and I still haven't done shit about it. You know, I, I haven't, I haven't put on a uniform. I haven't done anything. And you know, my, my little brother, he, he joined, he, he's at least doing something about it. And so I was like, you know what? I, if he could do it, I can do it. So in, right. I'm young enough and I'm healthy enough. Uh, you know, why not me? Why, why don't I join? There's no good reason why, why I shouldn't. Um, so before your brother served, you mentioned you came from a patriotic family growing yeah. up desert storm. I remember those days with Whitney Houston singing the national anthem at the Super Bowl, or right. getting, getting goosebumps, everybody across the country, yep. everybody very proud of, of what we did. We got in got out of course we had to go back later but uh was your brother the first person in your family to serve that you were directly connected to and it was just uh people in your family were just proud to be american but hadn't served no our our parents generation came from a, a different time right yeah. So, so my, neither one of my parents served. Um, they, they grew up during the Vietnam era and, you know, the military was not looked at in the same way as it is now, you know, and uh, not to say that they were anti-military or, or anything like that, but um, you know, they were, they were on the younger side for, for Vietnam. So they, they were turning 18, like as the war was ending and, and as the draft was ending and, and things like that. So um, the eighties were so, slim. Right. Yeah. So, so they, I mean, when they, when they were looking at the military, they were looking at people that they went to high school with that, you know, maybe were a little bit older who, or lived in their neighborhoods who were coming back from overseas, either disfigured or not coming back at all and things like that. So there was a, you know, there, there was that healthy respect for what they did over there, but also a little bit of fear about, you know, old. I don't want to end up like that, you know, that type of thing too. And, um, you know, my, uh, my grandfather on my dad's side, he served in the Navy during world war two. Uh, he was at Iwo Jima and, um, uh, in the Philippines, he was out in the Pacific area. And my, my grandfather on my mother's side, he grew up in Poland, uh, during world war two. Um, you know, he wasn't in the, the Polish army or anything like that, but he got still got captured by, by, uh, you know, a Nazi, uh, I guess a general or whatever over there. And, and, uh, he was like forced into kind of slave labor almost, um, while he was over there. So they, they, you know, that generation definitely knew the, the horrors of war. My parents, you know, kind of, uh, saw what they saw on, on television and, you know, people coming back from, from over there. But, um, but yeah, as far as my brother goes, he, he was the first one, uh, to, to join, uh, you know, you know, from our, my immediate, you know, close family, um, my cousin, uh, he joined the Marines, uh, and I forget the timeline that if he joined first or my brother joined first, I don't, I'm not sure which one was which, but, um, you know, uh, they, you know, so uh, the three of us were like the, the ones who, who really, uh, kind of joined the military and kind of uh, did that for our family. I, I grew up in Connecticut. Um, oh, and okay. so, so I, I lived, it's a real hotbed of military recruiting there in, in <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, there was, there were like, there was one military base. There's one, one Navy base down in, in, uh, Groton, New London area in, in right. Connecticut, um, uh, where the, the sub base. Yep, exactly. That's, that's what it's known for. Um, but other than that, there was like, 
it was basically nothing, you know, so if you wanted to serve in Connecticut, uh, you know, it was basically on the sub base or the national guard or reserves or, or whatever. Um, and so, so that's what, what my, my brother and I ended up doing. We ended up uh, joining the, the national guard. He stayed up in Vermont, um, you know, where, where he trained, he just got to know the guys up there. It was a great culture, uh, you know, that, that he fit in with. And, uh, you know, I stayed in Connecticut. I wanted to stay a little closer to home, but. Did um, he serve in the national guard while he was going to Norwich? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I like yeah. So I know you could do that. You know, you know what? We didn't either. When he first, uh, he first said he wanted to go to that school. Um, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, we were thinking, okay, that means he's going to be in the military. This is a time of war. He's going to go overseas and, and whatever. And he's like, no, it's not like that. You know, you don't even have to join the military after graduating. Uh, but then he joined the national guard and we're like, okay, well now you're definitely going, you know? Right. So, so, so you decided to join the national guard uh, in, in kind of a response to the needs of the the United States, you saw that right. what around 2005, you said you saw yeah. that, that there was a shortage. You were already mm-hmm. still, still pretty hot from, from September 11th. Then there was yeah. 2003, the invasion in Iraq, and you just felt the call to serve in the, in the national guard. So did you just go to the local recruiter and say, I'm here to sign up college? Be yeah. damned. It, it was the easiest sell that that recruiter had ever, ever had. It, it was like, I, I just, I walked in, I said, where do I sign? And he's like, well, you know, don't you want to know about career opportunities or whatever? I was like, no, I want to, I want to I, I wanna do infantry. I, that's what I know. My brother did it. Uh, if he could do it, I could do it. I know it's, it's not the easiest uh, MOS to, to join, but, but screw it. If, if my little brother can do it, then, then there's no way I'm going to let him one up me on that. So yeah, I'm going to do that too. And uh you know, so I, I had to get, you know, paperwork together. I, I, I didn't really go fully prepared because I, you know, there's a bunch of stuff I needed to get together and, and everything before I could actually, uh, you know, sign on the dotted line or whatever. But, um, you know, it, that, that took me, you know, a, a couple of days to get all that stuff together. And then, um, you know, from there, it was just off, you know, to, Fort Benning. Uh, off to Fort Benning. Yeah, I, I actually had a, a, a couple months. They, they gave me they said you have like a year window that you you can go off to, to basic training from the time that you enlist. So um, with the job that I had just started out, out of college, um, it was like a, an incredibly busy time uh, of year. I, I worked as an accountant at a, a CPA firm. And during tax season, it's just it, it's just incredibly busy. And I, I didn't want to leave them short staff during that that time period. So I I decided to kind of delay my my uh, entry into uh, basic training uh, by just not not doing that until after the dust kind of settled with all that. So right. I ended up going uh, to basic training, uh, did all that. Uh, during that time period, my brother was in I- Iraq. He he did get deployed uh, with, yeah. with his unit. So um, he was in Ramadi. This was in 2006. So that, that was like a really hot time over there in, in yeah. uh, Ramadi. And, um, you know, he, he wrote me a couple of letters and, and told me kind of like what, what was going on over there. And it was, it was bad. You know, they, they were getting uh, in contact almost on a daily basis. And, you know, if it was just really crazy over there. Um, and I remember going to one of my drill sergeants and, you know, anyone who's been to basic training, you don't ask a drill sergeant for a favor, like for anything. But I, I was like, look, uh, I wrote down my brother's name and his information on a, on a piece of paper. I said, look, I, I don't have access to the news or a telephone or anything like that. I said, would you be able to just take a look and, you know, if anything came out, you know, about him, you know, and I didn't know anything about red cross messages or any of that kind of stuff at the time, but I said, could you just let me know? And he's like, yeah, no worries. I got you. So like, that was like a weird situation, but I, I was just yeah. like, you know what, fuck it. I'm going to ask. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you, you have to, you have to. Yeah. And, so, you know, what's the worst you could say is like, shut up private, get back to where you're right. Going. Or did you join exactly. as a specialist, by the way? Yeah. I, so because I had a, a college degree, I, I got in as a, a specialist um, and Put in why I enlisted. Immediately. Yeah. Well, and, well, the, the very first thing they said to me as I was getting off the bus, they, they looked at the, the rank on my, my uh, shirt and they were like, you want to die? Is that why <laughs> you're here? You want to die? And I was like, oh, how do I answer that? You know, <laughs> but um 
But yeah, the reason why I, I enlisted versus, you know, going the officer route was because, you know, like I said, I was, I was extremely proud of my brother and, and the decision he made. And I didn't want anything that I was going to do to kind of overshadow what he had done. I didn't want to be, you know, a higher officer rank or anything like that. And, and quite frankly, I didn't really care about the rank at the time like that that didn't mean anything to me um you know i thought it might to him so i i was like you know what i'm just going to enlist and our entire time that we were in the military um we stayed at just about the same rank all the way through he got promoted uh to e4 while he was in iraq uh so when he came back he came to my graduation we were both specialists and then uh we both got promoted to sergeant at Ouch. about the same time too Ouch. yeah so, oh man was he was he upset about that was he a little bit salty there's all that no, all he, sibling rivalry. I, I come, my brother's in the military too. So yeah, no, he, he was good. He was good with it. But you know, one, one of the things I never wanted to do was like to outrank him, right. uh, you know, and, and when we got promoted, it was, you know, within you know a couple of weeks of each other. So wow. it was, it was really close. So were um, you in the same unit in the national guard? Well, so we were, so we were in two different, um, uh, we we're in two different units, but our, our they fell under the same uh, brigade. Uh, so, so when we got deployed in 2010, uh, the whole, it was a whole brigade wide deployment. So uh, it encompassed the Vermont national guard and the Connecticut national guard. Um, and, and so we all got deployed at the same time. And so that, that's how my brother and I ended up in, in Afghanistan, uh, in 2010 at the same time. Okay. So you ended up serving how long in the national guard? Uh, just under six years. Um, so when I was in. Yeah, when I was in Afghanistan, I had uh, gotten injured, and um, uh, this was towards the end of my enlistment, anyways. Um, but I had gotten injured with with my knee, and and when I came back home, I had uh, knee surgery, and it was going to take me right to the end of my enlistment uh, with 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 uh, recovery. And so I felt like a the biggest piece of crap just sitting there at my at our trainings doing nothing while everyone else is running around doing whatever because I like I couldn't carry weight, I couldn't run, I couldn't rock i couldn't do anything right. and so i would just be sitting there watching everyone else do it so i, I felt like the biggest piece of crap so i, I eventually I, I got out uh a little bit before uh, my enlistment was up um just because of the that that injury but okay but not okay, by much so, only, only it was only a couple months hey have, having had knee surgery myself and had to lay around for a bit i, I understand yeah <laughs> hey scott one thing i'd like to do is you know we we have a lot of serious things that go on in the military, obviously, but there's also a lot of really funny times and, and good memories. And I always ask people, what's something that happened to you that it's got to be something that's embarrassing, something, something interesting yeah. that, that confide in me here. Come on, Scott. Right. Hear it. So I, I actually got a couple of things. So, so hear one, it. um, we were in Fort Polk, uh, training up before we got, uh, uh, out to Afghanistan and anyone who's ever been down there knows it's a great like, place. Beautiful. It's a, yeah. It's nice wonderful. Food, it's beautiful. People, I mean, palm trees, weather. drinks, you know, beach and everything. Oh yeah. It's perfect. Okay. So on one of the rare days when it was pouring rain and the ground is soft <laughs> as, as anything, um, our, our, our uh, platoon leader had the great idea to go take some of the guys out with the Humvees. And the, by the way, the up armored hum, Humvees, so really heavy, which does great on soft ground. Um, decided to have the great idea to take us out driving through this course that he mapped out through the woods. And and there's like this trail that went through was like this dirt road, supposedly a dirt road. It was mud by the time we got there. And it was flooded and everything. And and he was like, no, just push through, push through. And we, we pushed through. We followed what he was saying. We got all of our trucks stuck in the mud. And th so we left like around like, I don't know, five or six at night. And we were only supposed to be out for like an hour or two. We weren't going to be out like all night. We ended up not getting back to our, our uh, platoons area until probably about lunchtime the next day, like sometime around noon the next day. We were out all night pushing trucks through the mud. We were chopping. We luckily had some axes in the truck and we chopped some trees down to like wedge under the, the wheels to get traction. And it was the most miserable experience. It was so long. We were wet. We were we were frustrated and everything. But the cool thing about that was so our entire platoon was out on this this uh, this uh, drive around. 
it brought us together like so much, like sometimes that, that shared suck experience just brings people together and, and it kind of like unites you in that, that, um, uh, you know, I'm in and a brother suffering. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. It was, it was something what like was that. that. What but, was their first, the first commanding officer, uh, oh. the, the one they all hated on band of brothers. I can't think of it right now, but yeah, I can't think of it, think of who it was, but I know what you're talking about. And, and it was like that, but what we hated was that experience. Like we hated the fact that we were in like well past our knees in mud wow. uh, trying to walk through this and get our trucks out. And it was so exhausting. It was like the, it was just terrible. At one point, I think we were actually off of the base somehow. I don't know how we got off because there was this footbridge over this little stream that, that we, we came across and it was beautiful. I mean, whoever built this put some time and effort into it. And we took those axes and we, we destroyed it. We destroyed it. And we took the bridge and we brought it over and we shoved it under the tires and we used that to get the trucks out. All right. Because you, it was you're perfect. the one who built the footbridge at Fort Polk. <laughs> You, we now know who destroyed it. Scott Deluzio, I'll, I'll send you his address if you ask. Yeah. And uh, yeah, if you, if you get any hate mail over that, I will, uh, I'll go back and I'll, I'll build them a new bridge or something. All right. All right. Uh, pro- probably, accepted. probably not, but you know, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. If, the, the word, if the email is strongly worded enough, maybe I will. Um, <laughs> you said okay, you had another then, one. I had another one. So before we went to Fort Polk, we were, uh, both my, my unit and my brother's unit, we're in uh, camp Atterbury, Indiana. Oh um, yeah. I've been there haunted hospital. And, yeah. That thing was freaking crazy. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. That was, that was a nightmare. Um, and it definitely is haunted. No one will ever convince me otherwise. Yeah, it's definitely. Uh, haunted. That place is creepy. It is. Um, you got a weird name. Muscatatuck. Seems like yeah, that's what creepy. it was. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. We were, we were freaked out and we, we did all sorts of stuff at night there too. That was, that was crazy. Um, but anyway, so we're, we're at, uh, uh, Camp Atterbury and the day that we were leaving Camp Atterbury and we we're driving down to Fort Polk, um, our, our company missed, uh, or at least my, my squad or, or whatever, we, we missed our time, like a lot of time for, uh, like dinner chow. And so we had a few minutes before, uh, before the buses were going to leave. So we we decided to sneak in and go, go grab some food. And, uh, my brother's unit happened to be in there. That happened to be his time that, that he was in there. So he called me over. And so I had my assault pack on cause I, like everything else was loaded up on the trucks and I had like no room for, for, everything like every like they gave us like way more stuff than we had space for so i had like crap hanging off of my bag i looked like a hobo like like a homeless guy like just just wandering around and so he calls me over and he's like oh come on come on sit with me or whatever and so i'm sitting there with him and the rest of his squad and he's just ripping into me about how how i look like a homeless dude and he's like he's just he's making fun of me so much but this is just like if you if you knew him Mm -hmm. that's just who he was like he would he'd find out the the little thread that was coming undone and he would pull on it and just unravel the whole thing yeah oh yeah you know and he would just do but if anyone else started you know trying to pick on it on anything about me he'd jump down their throat it's like you don't get to fucking talk to my brother like that yeah (laughs) Yeah. You know, but, but he, he would just, he was just laying into me and I was, I was taking it cause I knew I looked like a jackass with all the, the crap hanging off my bag and everything. But um, yeah, it, it was just, it was just funny. It, you know, it was a good memory yeah, that were, I had uh, of, of him. Like a walking yard sale, right? Yeah. And I had, I had a target painted on my back. Like yeah. it was an easy target. It was low, low hanging fruit form. He definitely. Please tell me you also had birth control glasses on. Oh, I didn't know. Uh, oh, at the time I did bad. not. I did not wear glasses, but, um, but he did when, oh. when he was in basic training, he got issued the birth control glasses. For those and, oh who don't God. know, these are glasses that are so ugly that there's no way you're going to get anybody pregnant. So they call them <laughs> birth control glasses. They're there's in fashion pit- now, probably. They probably are. Yeah. Because the, the military stopped issuing those and they, right. they, Turned to something else, so that yeah, they're probably cool the now. But and like East Village he, is wearing them right now. He found them at like Goodwill, like you know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's like, yeah, these look cool, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah. But um, there's actually a picture of him and I wearing. Uh, he had two pairs of the, these glasses. Him and I wearing them, and I was I was just screwing around. I was like acting like a jackass with them on, and uh, so he he came over and we took a picture, and it, it, it's pretty funny. But, wow, yeah, that's that's 
those are good good times good stories so yeah. you know i i know that well what do i say I, I know i don't know what it's like to leave the national guard right i don't it's a different situation for me so in between right. your in the six years that you served what's that like going off to be a soldier then coming back to be uh an accountant yeah i it it's weird um you know when when you have uh you know the one week in a month and two weeks a year training you know so sometimes you have to report in like friday night or or whatever and so you're going into work and you you have this big you know acu camouflage bag and stuff and you're you're bringing that into work what your change of clothes that you're going to change out of uh so you can you know report in in uniform on time and everything and um you know, it's weird. Like everyone else is talking about their weekend plans, like what they're going to do and where they're going to go and, and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go sleep in the woods this weekend uh, because yeah. you know that's just what we're doing, you know? Um, you know, so, so it, it's definitely a, a, like a different lifestyle, um, you know, when, when you're in the national guard, even though it's, it's not a full-time mm. uh, f- full-time deal. It's, it's just, it's just different because, right. you know, there, there are, you know, things that you, you miss out on. There's, you mm. know, things that you do with your family on the weekend, like you, you miss out on some of that because you're just, you're not going to be there for all of them. Um, you know, and, and even social interactions and other, other things like mm-hmm. that, you're just not going to be around for them. So, so it was definitely different, but um, as far as your, your path out, do you think like when you did decided to get out and, and I know yeah. and we'll talk about some of the other challenges you had when you were leaving the military, but as far as just transitioning into full on civilian mode. So it's almost like, yeah. all right, drills over and I'm never going back. It's the way I think of it. Yeah. You know what? It, it was kind of weird because when I got back from Afghanistan and I started going back to work at my, my civilian job, I felt like I just couldn't relate to those, to the people that I was working with my coworkers right. anymore. Like I, I just had a, you know, and and there was definitely some PTSD and some, some other stuff going on there. Um, And so, you know, when I was, you know, at work and, you know, like people do, they, they show up late to meetings or they, you know, don't, they're not prepared and and everything like that. I was just like, I was ready to jump down their throats. And I was like, these people are are like, who are these people? They're supposedly professionals, but what the hell is this? You know? And it, it just, was mind boggling to me. And, and I had a, just a hard time relating in general to, uh, to people, you know, when, when we were, uh, back home, um, you know, part of that was, was PTSD. Some of that was the grief and we'll get into that, but, right. um, you know, there, there's just, there's a lot, there was a lot going on. And so, um, you know, I got back in like August of 2010 and when, I ended up getting out of the national guard. It was in June of 2011. And, uh, you know, I had submitted my paperwork to be discharged, uh, early. Um, and, and again, we didn't get into all the details of, you know, kind of went on what went on in Afghanistan. So, you know, I'm not going to give any spoiler alerts quite yet, but so I I put in the paperwork and, uh, when it got approved, I I got a phone call and said, uh, yeah, by the way, your, your paperwork got approved. So, so I went to bed the night before, you know, still thinking I'm in the national guard, I'm still a soldier, you know, yeah, all that. And then the very next morning I got a phone call and it was like a light switch. It's like all of a sudden, no, I'm not anymore. Right. And, and there was like no, like, Gump. yeah, kind of. Yeah. It was just like, you know, here you go. You're done. And did you get you know, to goodbye. Keep, did you get to keep your, your ping pong paddle though? <laughs> <laughs> I, I never got issued one. I never got oh, issued a ping pong oh. paddle. So that that's too bad. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're like, yeah, uh, that's it. You know, just yeah. you know, drop off your, you know, whatever equipment you still have and, and that's it. And, and, and it wasn't like I had much. Becoming, or being an accountant. Is that right? Yeah, yeah but, pretty much. With the experience and the frustration of having to deal yeah. with um with people again, normal people who you can't knife hand. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean you could, but they look on it, they frown on that. <laughs> they, you know, they do frown they, on they look that. At that bad. Yeah, yeah, you're not allowed to call anybody numb nuts. Uh no. But uh Scott, I, I think you know, without delaying any further, I think it's it's important at this juncture to get into you know, the book, why you wrote right. the book. So Scott, you, it was August, right? That you had released Surviving Son. Yeah. So 
uh, obviously, Surviving Son tells a story of, unfortunately, the grief of losing your brother, being a Gold Star family member, having lost yeah. your brother. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll kind of talk about like what what my brother was doing and, and what what he was up to over there and and what kind of led to, uh, the, you know, those events, uh, what led up to his death. But, um, you know, he was he was operating uh, out of an area in uh, eastern Afghanistan and um, his his unit was aware of this, this, uh, village that had a lot of Taliban activity, you know, a lot of Tal- Taliban soldiers, uh, you know, going into this village and either they're living there or they're, they just frequented there or whatever. And, uh, they went to go patrol through this village and see what they could find. And, you know, they had some intelligence that there would be some, some people there. And so they, they went to go check it out. And, um, you know, like anyone who's been to Afghanistan, know there's there's hills and mountains all over the place, yeah. right? And so as they're approaching this this village, um, they had gone through like one section. They cleared, you know, some of the the buildings and everything. And as they're approaching, kind of like this other part of the village, they're coming around this mountain, uh, you know, this or this hill or whatever. And so part of the unit they they got split up. They were part of it was on on top of uh, the hill, and the other part was down lower on the hill as they were coming around. And so. Um, as they're coming around, dismounted, they got, I assume, or yeah, yeah, dismounted. Right. Yeah. Um, as they're coming around my, uh, uh, they, they walked into an ambush basically. Um, and so they all kind of scrambled for cover, uh, return fire, all that kind of stuff. And as they were returning fire, my brother, uh, turned around and looked back to, to someone who was, who was near him and it went to go say something to him. And as he was about to start start talking his head kind of jerked back and then he slumped back on his uh his assault pack that he had had on and uh he he was killed pretty much instantly oh. and and uh so you know they the person who who saw it happen uh called for a medic you know medic did what they could to to get there but you know anyone who's ever been under fire knows it's not it's not easy moving uh as as you're running and dodging bullets at the same time so um you know they got to him realized he was, he was KIA, nothing they could do for him. And so then the mission uh, kind of switched into a recovery mission. Now, now they had to, right. to get, get him out of there and get his body out and, and then, um, you know, do, do whatever they could to, you know, make sure that no one else got, got killed. Um, another Afghan, uh, I forget if it was Afghan uh, army or, or border patrol or something like that, that one of them got, got killed as well in that initial ambush. Right. Um, and, and several others got injured. Um, but then as they were uh, removing my, my brother's body from the, from that, uh, that area and trying to uh, evacuate him out, uh, another, another soldier, uh, his name is Tristan Southworth. Uh, he was killed in action as well. Um, he, he got hit uh, in, during that recovery process. So, so now it got that much worse because now they had two people that they had to evacuate from there. Um, and so, the easiest way for them to to get out of that situation was to go uh, down the hill, and there was a like a house that that was built into the hill, and so like the roof was part way up the hill, and and so they they went straight down the hill, and that was you know uh, the the terrain over there is you know like Pretty loose bad. rock, awful shale, kind of you know whatever. It's very loose and it's very difficult to walk downhill uh, as you know unless it's a paved trail or whatever like that. But but it, it's very hard to do. So most of the way down, everybody was just kind of falling down the hill. Um, the the two bodies were were basically slid down the hill uh, to to get them out, and they got onto the roof of this house and they cleared the house um, and used that as kind of like their uh, casualty uh, collection point to uh, you know kind of figure out what to do next from there. Um, but that day for them lasted hours and hours and hours, and it just went on and on um, and they they were not able to leave because they, they couldn't get back to their trucks, you know, and there was still such a huge presence of, of the, uh, the enemy fighters that were, that were around them. It was just, it was just a bad situation for them. So, right. um, and you know, so that, a bad situation, obviously oh, worse. Yeah, for sure. And, and it was, it was, you know, it just got compounded, you know, when they had right. the, the two and, and everything, it, it just, it was just so, this so being, much worse. So, and this being a national guard unit, are these 
folks from your area, right? Or from your state or a combination right. of, of some small states, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, my, like I said earlier, my brother had deployed previously to Iraq and, and a lot of the people who were in his unit were, um, were deployed with him. So there was that real close bond that he had with, with those people, you know, uh, anyone who's been in, in combat knows the, the bond that you, you form right. between the people that you served with. Um, and so he really had that, that close bond. And, and one of the first people to to get to him after he was, he was shot um, was one of his best friends. Wow. Um, and, and he got there and he, he was, he tried to do, you know, whatever he could to help him, but the, there really wasn't much that, that he could do. So, um, so yeah, that, I mean, that, that yeah. was what happened with him. And you were, um, you were in Afghanistan at the same time, right? I was, yeah. And I, I was well, actually out on, at the same time. I, I was on a mission that same day um, in a, a different part of Afghanistan, but uh, you know, we're still in Eastern Afghanistan. So we're, we're relatively close, um, right. you know, but, but we weren't like part of the same uh, operation or anything like that. So uh, we had flown into this remote village on, on helicopters the night before. And um, you know, where I injured my knee was getting off of the helicopter um, because, you know, we're, we're carrying, uh, rucksacks with about a hundred pounds of stuff in it plus all of our body armor and, and all that kind of you guys, stuff you guys were playing on staying a couple days it sounds like yeah we're we're yeah we had you know food and water and ammo and and all that kind of stuff we were going to be there for a while and um and as i was getting off the helicopter uh you know i got the green light to to you know walk off you know like like they they tell you to to go ahead and and get off. And this was, this was at night. So there's no sunlight or anything like that. I just had my, my nods on, uh, and no depth I couldn't perception. see no depth perception. So I couldn't see how far off the ground we were. And we were still probably about, you know, maybe three, four feet off the ground. And I step off thinking I'm stepping onto solid ground and then I fall. And that's where I busted up my knee oh. was, was on that fall. And, you. uh, it got, it you, got me, it got me back. <laughs> and plus I, w- I was the first one off. And uh, so I had an entire platoon of guys about to come walking on top of me. So I had to like, did they use get up and, well, I think the first one kind of like tripped over me. And then I, I, I was like, I got to haul ass and get out of here. Cause I can't have, you know, 30, 40 guys like walking all over me. Um, and, uh, you know, so we're, we're working with the Afghan army, uh, during, during this, this mission. And so we went down in the, in the village and I like to describe it as, uh, for anyone who hasn't worked with foreign, uh, foreign troops. Um, I, I like to think of it as like, we were the driver's ed instructor where we we're there to kind of pump the brakes if things got out of control, but they right. were the one behind the wheel. Right. Um, and it didn't really work out all that well, but, um, it was what it was. That was what we were told to do. So we did it. Um, and so anyways, we, we go down into this village. We had to wait until uh, daybreak because the Afghan army didn't have any night vision technology or anything like that. So they couldn't see what they were doing. Not yet. And not well. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pause there and fast forward a few years. You know, yeah. Yeah, now they have plenty of it. <laughs> but they did. Um, they did. Yeah. <laughs> but go ahead. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. I interrupted. Yeah, no, that's okay. Yeah. So, so we let them do their thing and go, go try to, you know, clear the village and make sure that, uh, you know, we had intelligence that there was Afghan, uh, army uniforms that were stolen by the Taliban in some of these, these, uh, villages. So we, we went and we're searching for all that. We found some stuff, but no people, we just found the the uniforms and, and a few weapons and things like that, which is super suspicious. Like why yeah. would, why, why would like that stuff be there, but no people. So we're like, okay, what, what's going on with that? Um, but then at, like later on that day, I get a call on the radio from my uh, commanding officer and he's looking specifically for me. And I was an E5 sergeant, like mm-hmm. the, a captain doesn't usually jump the chain of command like that and, and go straight down to a sergeant unless there's something either really, really good or really bad, you know, that happened. Right. And so I'm like, I just did my job. We didn't do anything spectacular today. So what the, what got screwed up, you know, and I'm, I start checking my guy's equipment, like, you know, who lost something, you know, whatever. Um, I'm trying, I'm running through my mind, what went wrong. And, uh, you know, eventually I linked back up with him. I couldn't figure it out. And he's like, uh, why don't you come on over here, uh, take your helmet off and, and take a knee. And I was like, why take my helmet off? We're outside the wire. Like you never do that. Like that, that's just mm-hmm. weird. And then I, you know, I, I just busted up my knee earlier that day. And I was like, I I don't want to take a knee, but okay, I'll, I'll do it anyways. And so 
so uh you know I, I take a knee and he's like yeah so your your brother's unit got got ambushed and uh he he got hit uh in in the attack and so my mind just jumps to big brother mode like how do i get to him what can i do to help him do, you know if he needs blood you know I, I think we're the same blood type like if you need blood or you know an organ or whatever let, like get me to him get me a helicopter yeah. get me to him and i'm going to help him however i can <laughs> But what I didn't understand was that that he was killed uh, in the the ambush, and um, and so when when I, that realization hit me, I I just broke broke down, and I was a complete did they, mess. Did the commander, um, did your command officer, explain it at that point? Like, no, it's he was, yeah. He explained it. He explained it to me because I I think you know throughout that whole deployment, I had this almost like denial that anything bad could happen to him. I was you know it was almost like one of those things where. Um, it's like, just like, well, that just happens to other people. That's not going to happen to me. I, right, exactly. And, you know, you know, Afghanistan, you know, maybe, maybe it was, uh, you know, heating up around that time, but, you know, it wasn't Ramadi, you know? Right. And so, like, if he got through that, like, he's going to be fine, you know? And I think I had to almost lie to myself and tell myself that there's no possibility that he would get injured or killed because I wouldn't be able to focus on my job right. if if I told myself otherwise, I'd, I'd be worried about him the whole time. And so, you know, yeah, when, when the, uh, when he told me what, what had actually happened, I, I was just a wreck. Um, you know, and I, I had, um, I had guys come like, stay with me. I, he, I was never left alone after that. Like people were, were always, you know, around me and everything. And, um, shortly after finding out about 20 minutes after finding out uh, the people that we missed down in the village, well, they started shooting at us and, you know, we started taking RPG and small arms fire. And, and so I was like, Holy crap, I, I got to put this grief aside, put all my personal issues aside right now and literally and figuratively put the army hat back on and, and go be a soldier and lead right. my guys and make sure that some, some anger, like, all right, oh my God, yeah. it's time to take it out on the enemy. Oh my God. Yeah. I, I was, I was beyond angry. I, I was angry at every single person who lived in Afghanistan. Uh, I was, I was angry at them for not taking care of this on their own and requiring good people like my brother to come there and, and get killed. I, right. It was just, just my grief turned to straight anger and hatred towards I, I even hated, you know, the people I was friends with our interpreters. I, I hated them. I was like, why aren't you doing more? Why aren't you, you know, out there, you know, getting shot at? And meanwhile, they were getting shot at in right. the middle of this. So I, I, I just wasn't in my right head. Um, but interesting that, that in, in that instance, obviously every man who can, or woman, every man and woman who could handle a firearm at that time or a weapon system, you're needed. And yeah. like you said, you, you said you had to put your grief aside um, as heavy as it was. And then go exact some vengeance. Yeah. They let you near the 50 cal or the 240. I guess you guys probably had at that point. Yeah, we we didn't have the 50 cal with us on that. That that was all. You know, we were all dismounted, so that was a little yeah. little much to, to carry around. But um, you know, I was a I was a squad leader at the time, so I had I had my whole squad uh you know that I was in charge of, and and uh, you know I there wasn't much cover where we were, and right. we, we kind of like took some rocks and like built them up to You're the make low a, well, we were up on, on top of the hill. Okay. Um, so, so like we had that going for us, we had the high ground. Um, but you know, we had a direct line of sight, you know, to, you know, wherever the, the fire was coming from. And, uh, my, one of my saw gunners, uh, he, he was, uh, he was near me. He was kind of like right next to me and, and he looks down the mountain and, and he's like, like, Oh crap. I, I see this guy, you know? It, and he starts like describing like where it is and everything like that. I was like, you got a saw, just shoot, like kill just, just, just kill him and just keep shooting until he stops moving. And, uh, you know, so that was satisfying to be able to tell him to just like, you know, right. unload and just unleash some, some fire down that way. And, uh, you know, and there was this this small building kind of off in the distance, and and we thought that there were some some people in there kind of hi hiding out, and so we had our our two hundred threes, uh, you know, just lob some grenades over there and uh, and try to take that out. Our our CO wasn't exactly uh, confident that that they had rooted all of them out, so he called in for air support and had that building completely leveled, um, which wow. was also satisfying, satisfying to see. Right? Yeah. How how um, long did this firefight last? Uh, you know, 
I, it's hard to say. It's right. one of those things right. where when, when you're in it, it feels like it, like an eternity. But when you look back on it, it feels like it was, you know, two seconds. And right. and so, uh, like, I, it's really hard for me to say. I didn't even look at my watch at the time, but um, it, it was you had all of that. The all other that stuff, stuff going on. That, yeah. so, so you're in this firefight. Yeah. Probably and, at this point, consciously trying not to think of the grief that you're holding, ready to just get yeah. through that fight. And I'm I'm thinking to myself, like, I need to make sure that I stay alive so that right. my parents don't get a second knock on the door. So that my my newborn son, he was born just before uh, I left for Afghanistan. So he doesn't grow up without a father. And my wife doesn't grow up without a uh, husband. And, uh, you know, and I, then I thought, thought about all the guys in my squad. And I was like, you know, I, if anything happens to any of them, mm-hmm. because my, I didn't have my head in the right place, then I don't know how I'll be able to handle that. And right. so I, I was like, okay, I just need to focus and do my job. Um, you know, I went through a checklist of all the things I need to do. You know, any good squad leader knows what they, right. they need to do. And I, I went through this checklist and I was like, okay, this, I need to make sure that they're positioned in the right, right areas. So if we don't have, you know, uh, you know, any green on green kind of, uh, you know, thing going on or, or, or whatever, um, make sure that we got, ammo and, and everything else that they need. Um, and, and I was, I was just going through this, this mental checklist. I think it was just a way to ke- kind of keep myself grounded and focused on what I needed to do. Yeah. And yeah. so, so the firefight ends and I'm sure you felt like the whole world was sitting on you. Did they, Yeah. did they evacuate to, um, yeah. out of the country pretty quickly after that or, yeah, pretty quickly. So after the firefight um, took place, I I got uh, flown out to um, uh, to Bagram uh, Air Base, and um, that's where my brother also happened to be taken oh. to as well. And um, the next morning, I was uh, so after after I got there, uh, they took all my weapons away. Uh, my, I had a, a shotgun. I had M4. I had uh, you know all the ammo and all that kind of stuff. They took all that away from me, and I didn't realize it at the time. I, I was still processing what was going on, but you know I was on a like a suicide watch. They didn't want me to do anything wow. stupid or hurt myself. Um, you know. I wasn't suicidal, but I, I totally get where they could see that someone could get there really quickly too, especially when you have, you know, all sorts of weapons available to you. Um, so they took all that stuff away and they, they had someone stay with me the entire time. Uh, you know, there was always someone with me. Um, and so, uh, the next morning, uh, was the ramp ceremony for my brother and, and the other soldier who was killed. And, uh, anyone who's not familiar with a ramp ceremony, if you haven't been to one, it, it's where they bring the, uh, the boxes that are holding the transfer cases that are holding the, the fallen soldiers onto the plane that's going to take them out of the country. And so they, they're bringing them up the ramp onto the plane. Um, and then there's kind of a, you know, a little bit of a ceremony where there's like a receiving line almost where, right. um, where, where people go through, it's kind of like a, you know, a Catholic wake, uh, where, where people go through, pay their respects mm-hmm. and everything. And I felt very fortunate to be able to be a part of that because, you know, most, most fallen soldiers do not get the opportunity to have a family member there present, you know, during that. So I felt very fortunate that I was able to be there and represent him, uh, that way. Was it um, just the two Americans on that flight? Yes. Yeah. So it was, it was just them. Um, but it was also, um, they also use that, that same flight, uh, to transport other, uh, right. soldiers who, who yeah. were either going home on leave or, you know, whatever. And so I, I was fortunate enough to be able to get a seat on that flight. Um, oh, and, and they, him. they held everybody, uh, off of that flight until I got on the flight and they, they said, you, you get your, your pick of the seats on, on here. So I, I sat with the closest seat to, to my brother and, um, and I, I was just playing these scenarios out in my head. I, I still had that anger going on, but I was like, if anyone so much as like sneezes in the wrong direction near, near there and like so much as like hints at disrespecting him, his body, the, the, the flag that's draped over his, uh, is the transfer case. I, I was ready to just pounce on him and I was just playing these scenarios out in my head. It was weird. Um, you know, like no one was even gave me any reason to think that anyone would be disrespectful, but I, I was, I just had so much anger that I was just like looking for a fight with anybody. I didn't care if it was a general, like I, I would have just pounced all over him, you know, at this point, had your family been notified? 
Had you spoken no. to them? Oh, well, they they had been notified, but we we're still on that communications blackout because we didn't know um, whether or not they had been notified. And so right. while I was in Afghanistan that entire time, I did not get to, to speak to anybody back home. Um, it wasn't until we landed in Kuwait that I found out that, that my parents had been notified and that I was finally able to call home. So it was it was a very lonely uh, time, you know, where, you know, I was around people. Like I said, there was always people there, but I didn't always know who they were. Um, and so, like, all I wanted to do was just call home and and talk to my wife, talk to my parents, you know, just find out how they're doing. Obviously terrible, but, you know, I want to see like for myself and, and talk to them and hear from them. Let them know that I'm okay. You know, I was in yeah. Kuwait, you know, I, I was, I was safe and, um, you know, let them know that they didn't have to worry about me too. You know, that I, I was on my way home. Um, so yeah, so go ahead. I was just going to say, so that's, that's really an interesting situation that a lot of people don't understand it, especially if they haven't been in the military, the communications blackout. And in your case is so unique because at this point, your parents are thinking they, they might not even know that, you guys are separated geographically maybe it's by right. a mountain or whatever so their first thoughts probably is scott also wounded i haven't heard from scott so right. very heavy heavy circumstance that your family had to go through yeah and, and actually um the the missions that i was i was working on um it had taken us out to a pretty remote area for a few weeks. And so I hadn't called home. Um, so this, when my brother was killed, it was August 22nd. And I, I don't think I had called home since like July, um, you know, end of July, um, because we were just out and I didn't have an opportunity to call home. And so, um, my, my dad's first thought when he saw the, the uniform uh, officer standing at the door, um, he, he, was, he just said, uh, you know, is it Scott? Cause he just assumed it was me. He had just talked to my brother a couple of days earlier and um, you know, he just assumed that, that I had been killed in whatever we were doing. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, they told him no. And, and so, you know, they, he, he realized it was my brother. And when my mom find, found out, she just collapsed onto the ground. She was just, oh. you know, inconsolable. And uh, you know, but the, one of the first things she was able to say was, you know, is Scott okay? You know, where is Scott? And so that that's, you know, just goes to show the, the you know, type of person right. she was, she was, you know, even in with this terrible news, she was still worried about, you know, where I was and, and what I was doing and, and everything. So um, did the notifying they, they really, officer know that you were safe. Yeah. Never yeah. They, they knew that I, I had been notified and that I was on my way home. They didn't know specifically where I was. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, they didn't know specifically where I was at the time, but um, uh, they knew that I was on my way home. Uh, wow. You know, I, so I, at that point I was probably still in Bagram, uh, you know, uh, waiting, you know, to, to leave. But, um, but yeah, it was, it, it all happened, you know, so quick and, and it, it just, it, Ah, man, it, yeah. it was very, it was, it was hard. Very sorry that you and your family had to go through that. Obviously the, the, that's such a traumatic event and, and we'll, you know, I appreciate you going through the, the details of that day. I know it's hard, uh, but I do want to get into the fact that you wrote a book about this surviving yeah. son and what led you to write the book and what was, is that a process of your own healing? Getting it out yeah, there, getting yeah, it, it def definitely was a, a, a process to uh, uh, to process my my emotions and my my healing and, and all that. But um, you know, what I started off uh, when I first started writing what became this book, um, it really was just me journaling and writing down notes of things that happened, places that I was at, and things that I was feeling, and, and all that that kind of stuff, and. And the reason why I did it was because I knew that our memories fade over time and they play funny tricks and they distort facts and reality and everything. And I, I knew that my, my son, uh, you know, he'd grow up and, and I have uh, two more kids since then. So, so all, all my children, they would eventually grow up and they'd probably have questions about what I did in, in the war and uh, what happened to their uncle and, and things like that. And so I wanted to just write down as much as I could remember uh, back then and then a few years ago, I, I started thinking that, you know, this would be a pretty good book. It, it would be a good, good story. Um, and it could possibly also not, not just 
be an entertaining story or, you know, uh, you know, something that people read for, for the hell of it. Um, it could also help people too. Um, you know, people who might be experiencing, you know, their own traumatic loss or grief or, you know, whatever, um, uh, it, it can help them, uh, you know, see somebody else's, uh, point of view and and see what they went through. Um, I'm not saying I did everything right. As a matter of fact, in the book, I talk about all the things I did wrong, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, drinking too much and uh, sleeping too little. And, you know, all the the things that I did that were just so wrong and and keeping everything bottled up inside and not going to talk to someone, um, you know, early on, um, you know, I lied through my teeth when I, when we had the mandatory like mental health screenings and and everything Mm -hmm. after coming back, because I didn't want to talk to somebody. I wanted to just get back home to my family. I didn't want to spend more time talking to somebody else who I didn't know and, you know, burden them with my problems. So I, I lied. And so so I talked about all that stuff. Are you saying you, they, they still made you demob? Oh Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, this, wow, so that's, that that's interesting. That part, I, I figured they would. Yeah, take it home, buddy. Yeah. So I I did. I I came home when I when I was on my way home. I came home and I stayed home. Um, but when I was on my way home, um, they just gave me a two week leave, like anyone else would right. get, like if they're right. they're coming home. Um, and they're like, no, you're you're coming back. You know, they. The people who were, you Back know, in to the where? to Afghanistan. Oh, <laughs> and and I was like, the hell I am. Like I like I, I'm in no shape to be coming back after this. Um, and actually, at my brother's funeral. So for people who are unfamiliar with the National Guard, National Guard falls under both the state and federal uh, jurisdictions. So um, our uh, commander in chief, if you will, not in, in addition to the president, it's also, also the governor of the whatever state you're in. Right. Um, so the, the governor came to my brother's funeral and, and told us, told my family, she's like, I'm placing orders out that you're not going back to Afghanistan. So I was like, cool, got that. You know, not, not going back. Thank you. Thank you for that. You got my vote next time. <laughs> and, um, um, no, but, uh, but yeah, I, I was, I, I didn't think I was in any, any right, right mind to be going back over there. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't have been a good situation, but, um, I ended up getting a phone call about a, a week or so after his funeral. And, um, it was from the Connecticut national guard and they, they were like, yeah, you, you have to go back to Indiana, Camp Atterbury for uh demob and, you know, go through that, that whole process. Right. And so they're like, okay, we're going to send you next week. And it's going to be, you're going to be there for like, th- uh, I forget what it was like three days or something like that. And I'm like, again, the last thing I want to do is being away from my family. I, like right. I, I came home so I could be with my family and, uh, like, I just want, wanted to stay with them. I was like, I didn't understand why I had to go all the way to Indiana. Why couldn't I do that in, in Connecticut where, where my family was? Um, you know, it just didn't make any sense to me, but I did what I was told. And I, I went there and, um, they gave me three days to, to get through all of the, the screenings and everything like that. And I was done in one, in one day, I, I just flew through everything. Um, you know, I, I just got, got it all done and I actually had to get a, a my flight rearranged, you know, through the travel, uh, you know, office and everything. And, uh, I went, went back home the next day, um, which I was, I was glad to do, but the reason why I was able to get through everything so quickly is because I wasn't a hundred percent honest with all of the the screenings. Yeah. There's the mental health screenings and, and all that. And these people didn't even know, probably they, they didn't know who I was, my background, right. my story, or, yeah. and, for me to sit there and explain all that to them, that would have taken three days, you know, just, just as it was. And so like, I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be here anymore. I want to, I want to leave and I want to go home. Um, and that, and and it just didn't make any sense to me that, that they had to do all of this stuff all the way halfway across the country. Mm -hmm. Why couldn't we just do that? You know, at home where, you know, yeah, maybe it's going to take me three days to get through all this stuff, but I can go home and sleep in my own bed at night and and be around my my wife and my kid and and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, I don't know, first world world problems, but still, it was it was it was traumatic. You know, so oh. it, it was it was a tough situation to be in. Right. So you you took these experiences of uh, growing up, joining the military, serving yeah. with your brother, and of course, ultimately losing your brother and having to deal with your trauma 
the experiences, the mistakes you made along the way. But like you said, a lot of us fall into substance abuse, alcoholism, uh, and, and different things, anger, your family yeah. having to put up with all the emotions, I'm sure. Right. Um, and, and you managed or you, you thought it'd be a good idea to, to put this all on paper and, and, and yeah. share with the world. Yeah, I did. And, and, you know, for, for me, it was, it was a, a process of, of like a therapeutic process of, of writing all this stuff down and getting it all out there. And when, um, when I would get to the point where I was writing about the time of my, my brother's death and like how all that happened, I found myself just kind of like dancing around that and not really wanting to address that. And, and I, I would jump off. To something it off oh, yeah. It's, it, 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 it's, it, it can't be real, it, you know, right. if it's not on paper. Right. And, and so, um, then eventually I was like, you know, I, I need to do this. I need to put it out there. And, and so, um, so I, I, I just did it. And I, I sat down, I wrote, wrote it all down and it was like a big weight being lifted off my shoulders. Like I, I wasn't carrying around this burden by myself anymore. I, I had it down on this piece of paper and, um, you know, it, it was, it was hard to write, but it was relieving. Like once when I, I did it, it, it felt really good that, that I had this out there and, and part of the reason why I wanted to to write the story is because I know that my brother doesn't have a voice anymore. He can't tell his own story. He can't talk about his experiences and, and who he was and all that kind of stuff. It, it, his life, unfortunately was cut short. And so I feel like I can do that for him. I, I can be his voice. And, and I talk about this in the book too, where when, when I first came home, there were news vans lining all up and down my parents' street uh, from the local television, radio, uh, news, uh, newspaper, all that kind of stuff. And at first I, you know, that anger was just raging inside of me. And I was like, screw these people. They're vultures. They're just out to pick apart any little piece of a story that they can. And, but then it, it dawned on me that if, if we don't, my family uh, didn't tell them, you know, give them a story to to run. They were going to run a story one way or the other. They're, they're going to probably just go to some grocery store parking lot, get a random soundbite from, from someone. Oh yeah, this is terrible. It's a tragedy. And that would be the end of the story. Yeah. The, the book of Steven Deluzio would be closed and it would, that would be it. It would just start collecting dust. And, um, I was like, that's not going to happen. We, we need to tell his story. And, and so we told his story the way, the way we knew him, we knew, we knew him and we told people who he was, what, what type of person he was, all that kind of stuff. And, and I do that in the book too. I, I tell some funny stories about us growing up and um, you know, things that we, we experienced. I even, there's even a funny story as, as crazy as this might sound. There's even a funny story surrounding his death as well. Like, it, like I, you'll have to read the book. I'm not going to give the spoiler alert, I have you know, not read it yet, but I will, but, um, but you'll never look at bubble gum the same way. I'll just, I'll just leave that. <laughs> so, so you know what I'm talking about, gotcha. but, um, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, I was like, yeah, we need to, to just tell his story. And so that's, that's part of what I wanted to do with this book is, is tell his story and let his story and my story live out, you know, outlive all of us. Right. And, you know, it's now on, on paper, it's in, it's in a printed format. You know, th this book will, will last for, you know, years and years and years. And, it, you know, it's just one piece of a big puzzle of right. what went on over there. And, and I hope that we can someday put a lot of these pieces together and figure out what the hell went wrong uh -huh. and, and why, um, why things ended up the way they did. And, you know, yeah. it's bigger than just my, my story or your story or, you know, any, anybody else's, but, but when we have all of these pieces that we can fit together, maybe that'll help us understand uh, the big picture down the road. Yeah. And, and before we move on, and I know we we're getting close on time and I appreciate your, uh, you extending your hour with me, but yeah. uh, where's the best place to buy the book? Where's the, yeah, where's the it, place that's going to get you the most uh, in, in Amazon at least? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, well, you mentioned Amazon. Amazon's a, a good place to go. Um, the, the nice thing about that is they, they handle all the fulfillment delivery and all that kind right. of stuff. Um, I, I'm also selling the book on my website, survivingsonbook.com. Um, and you, you can go there. You can get a signed copy if you want, if you 
care to have a signed copy. I, I'm more than happy to do that for people. And I'll, I'll ship that out as soon as I can. I uh, got a whole box of books sitting right behind me. Right collecting dust. So, so might as well uh, order it from me. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it's available in Kindle paperback, hardcover format. So, you know, whatever, however you prefer to read a book, um, you know, it, we have it out there. Um, and uh, you can come sign yeah, so, phone. That's how I read my Kindle. You just yeah, I'll, I'll totally do that right across the, the screen <laughs> for you too. So every yeah. time you open up the screen, you know, like who, who it came from. <laughs> yeah. So Scott, um, you, you alluded to it. So I'm, I'm going to go there. Uh, I, I also served in Afghanistan. My brother served in Afghanistan. My brother was actually on a, uh, on a team with a, a soldier who lost his life. Um, sometime after his brother actually lost his life in yeah. Afghanistan as well. So my brother obviously dealt with that grief, still dealing with that grief, obviously, because we're all brothers in arms. Right. Um, but now that Afghanistan is over and we saw how we left Afghanistan, what were your feelings as all that was going on in in August, by the way, uh, right around the anniversary of your brother's death. Yeah, it, it was it was right around that that same time frame, and and so there that time of year is you know for the last eleven years now it's always raw raw emotion and yeah, yeah well it is fighting season too but it you know for me it, it's just Eternally, you know, brings back a lot fight of, season probably right yeah yeah it brings back a lot of memories and and. Um, you know, then, then adding this on top of all that, um, you know, it, it just, it just, it stung. It, it hurt, you know, how, how we, how we got out, you know, um, you want to, you want to feel like, you know, what we did had a meaning and that, that there was some purpose behind all of it. And it was, it was hard to, to really wrap your head around the, the meaning of it when we left the way we did. But my takeaway from all of it was, that we didn't lose all these lives and all this time and money and everything like that all for nothing. Um, you know, including my brother's life, we, he, he didn't give his life for nothing. Um, there was, I, I feel like a, a lot of good that was done over there. Um, you know, we, we took the fight to the enemy and we, um, we prevented another nine 11 type attack here in, in America. So I feel like, you know, these sacrifices that we made and we all knew what we were signing up for when we, when we joined the military, especially the ones who joined after nine 11. Um, so we knew that we we're, we we're going to go fight over there and we knew that we were going to fight so that we wouldn't have another nine 11 here at home. And I, I chalk that up as a uh, mission accomplished. You know, we, right. we didn't have another nine 11 here. We didn't have planes falling out of the sky into our buildings and, and, killing thousands of, of innocent people. Um, you know, we, we took the fight over there and, and we did a good job at that. We, we kept that fight over there. Um, and so we saved a lot of American lives, um, but we also saved a lot of Afghan lives. Um, they they didn't have to live under the Taliban rule for those 20 years. Um, and we, we provided, uh, schools and infrastructure to the, the people of Afghanistan and Rose. little girls, yeah, roads. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, um, Used little girls. Got, us. <laughs> well, yeah, they were. Yeah. Um, uh, but little girls, like, little, little girls had a chance to go to school for the first time ever. Right. You know, and and yeah. now some of those girls who went to school back when we were in Afghanistan, they're they're adults now, and right. they may have kids of their own. And I know as a parent, I want better for my kids than I I ever had. And I I think you know talking to a lot of parents like that's almost a universal truth. Like most, most parents want yeah. that for their kids. And I can only imagine that the people of Afghanistan, especially the ones who had the opportunity to go to school, um, that they want that for their kids as well. Um, and, and now that that's being taken away, I, I hope that that gives them a little something to fight for. Um, and I, I hope that the, the little bit of freedom that they got to enjoy for those 20 years uh, is, is something that they can use as fuel to, to go and fight and, and take back their country from, from the Taliban and, yeah, and say so. that, you know, we're not going to stand up for this, you know, time will tell with that, you know, maybe that's just, just wish, wishful think, thinking on my part, but um, you know, I, I really do hope that they, they will stand up and, and fight back. Yeah. And I think that most veterans of Afghanistan 
feel the same way that it's, it's a painful wound that yeah. we've, we've just endured. But I think most of us hope that that taste of freedom is still lingering in their mouth and without it, they're going to maybe rise up and, and thwart their dictatorship or their autocracy or whatever the Taliban wants to be right now. Right. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was tough. It was, it was an interesting time having, having like yourself, you've been to Iraq, right? It's, no, uh, it's, just, no, it's just my brother. It's your brother. In Iraq, yeah. 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 So myself being a veteran in both Iraq and Afghanistan, it's kind of like, man, spent a lot of time overseas and both those yeah. places are a wreck. <laughs> and some right. other places I've been as well. I'm just looking at the news today, not doing so hot. Um, but that's neither here nor there. But um, yeah, I think that's something that we're all going to have to deal with. Uh, one other thing I want to touch on before we leave, before we wrap it up is, is your podcast, the drive on podcast, which yeah. is a fantastic format and in the conversation flows flows nice and smoothly and and i was lucky enough to be be on there a couple months ago uh what brought you to doing a podcast and how has that helped your journey yeah so i mean after coming back from afghanistan uh you know our our company that that i was in was fortunate enough not to have lost any soldiers over there and um you know after we came home we started losing soldiers that that we served with to suicide. And, um, you know, that just didn't sit right with me. You know, one is too many, but when, when that second one, and, you know, when you, when you keep, you know, hearing about other people that you served with, um, you know, whether it was in Afghanistan or not, uh, to, you know, taking their own lives, it's like, what, what's going on here? Or, you know, we just came from a place where, where people literally wanted to kill us and they failed. And then we came home where people literally want the best for us. And now now we're failing again. And so like, what, what is going on with this? And so I, I felt like I couldn't just sit around and wait for someone else to take their life, whether I knew them or not. Uh, I felt like I needed to be proactive and do something about it. And I wanted to reach as many people as possible. I wanted to to reach as many veterans, their families, their their loved ones. I, I wanted to reach as many people. So I, I started the podcast um, because it's, it's a, you know, pretty easy way to, to get in touch with a lot of people at, at once. And so, um, what we talk about on the podcast, we, we talk to other veterans about their, their struggles and things that they they've had to overcome and how they overcame them. Um, because sometimes all people need to do is hear that they're not alone. You know, if you're suffering in silence over, over whatever it is, just knowing that you're not alone is, is helpful uh, to you. And so, so we talked to them about, about all, all of their, their struggles and, and what they've done to, to get through them. And then we talked to uh, uh, people who represent non- nonprofits and other organizations that are providing services to veterans, uh, things that are, you know, outside the VA's uh, scope of, you know, care that they provide. Um, because sometimes, you know, you may not want to go to the VA, you may not be comfortable with that, or you may not be qualified to go to the VA for whatever reason. Right. And so, um, you know, you, you, we have all these guests that, that have all these other resources that are available to veterans who, who are, um, doing great work to, to help out veterans that often little or, or no cost to the veteran. And they're, they're out there fighting for us and, and trying to make sure that we have all the tools and resources available to succeed and, and reduce that number, that, that 22 a day number, uh, you know, that, that people keep throwing around, um, you know, but it's more than just, you know, PTSD and, and suicide prevention. It's, it's, uh, careers, you know, talking about, you know, transitioning out of the military. It's, it's, um, you know, finding, uh, alternative uh, ways to find, find purpose in, in meaning, you know, what we did in the military had, it was incredible, incredibly meaningful and, and had a lot of purpose behind it. But when you get out of the military, sometimes you just, you, you feel lost. Like you don't have that sense of purpose or, or the camaraderie that you had with, uh, you know, the people that you were serving with. So we, we try to talk about those types of things and, and help people uh, uh, figure out how to have hope in, in themselves again. Now that's, and it's an excellent podcast. It's it's on my uh, 
subscription list, or I guess that's what you call it. Um, but I enjoy it every time I listen to it, and I enjoyed being being a guest. and And we really appreciate folks like you who are helping people get out there, learn what resources there are, and and hear from people like you said, so that so they're not alone or rudderless, right? right? Um, so one more thing, and that's I want to know what your advice is. What's your recommendation for? other veterans or spouses of veterans or just people who are going through some type of transition that away from some, from one thing to another phase of their life. What's, what's your, your advice? Yeah. I mean, I, I think we all are going to face some sort of transition, whether we're military or not, you know, you might work for, you know, 30, 40 years in a job and all of a sudden you retire. And that's another transition that a lot of people yeah. don't, don't necessarily think about, but, but that's going to come up and that's going to creep up on you at, at some point too. So, you know, when, when you're struggling with whatever the transition is, whatever, if it's grief, if it's a loss, uh, loss of identity, you know, things along those lines, uh, you know, it, it, recognize that it's okay to struggle with this type of stuff, but also recognize that you don't need to do it alone. You can ask for help. It's not, you're not crazy for asking for help to, to feel the things that you're feeling. And that's, that's normal. That's human emotions that you're, you're showing that you're human by, by saying, Hey, this is bothering me. Well, of course it's bothering you. It's hard. And so reach out for help. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a professional mental health counselor. You know, um, it, it could be a close friend or a family member that, that you're comfortable with talking to and, and just, just talk about things, you know, be open and honest about what it is that's going on with you. Um, and you know, if it's, if it's something where it's more than that, that person can handle, um, and, and maybe lead with, Hey, you know, if, if you're not comfortable with this, let me know. So, so right. it, this doesn't get weird, but um, <laughs> you know, if, if you're, if you're not able to find someone who can, who can help you through it, you know, a friend or a family member or whatever, reach out, talk to somebody, you know, find there, you know, open up the phone book and, or uh, that's showing my age right there, go to Google <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, you know, put in, you know, you know, whatever you're, you're feeling, if it's, depression or anxiety or, you know, PTSD, whatever it is. And, and, uh, you know, like just type in that plus like counselor in your zip code and you'll come up with somebody who can help you. You know, it might be through the VA, it might be through, uh, you know, some other private organization, but you'll find somebody who can help you and, you know, just don't, don't suffer alone, you know, let, let someone else know about it. And, and, uh, and de definitely, uh, you're not a burden. To those right. people, you know, if, if they, right. if they love you and care for you, you're not a burden. They, they want you to be, be happy and healthy and they'll do whatever they can to help you. So, um, you know, and it, it's, they're there in your life for a reason, you know, lean on them if you need it. Absolutely. So uh, I appreciate your time, Scott. I think we're, we're about out of time here. We're over time, but I appreciate you sticking around a little bit longer. Your story is so compelling and um, just, really thankful that you agreed to come on on the podcast and for everybody out there go to the drive on podcast i'll uh, i'll have the website in the show notes and while you're at it subscribe to that and also get scott's book which is surviving sun at amazon.com but preferably at the website which i'll also post in in the show notes get get an autograph while you're at it and uh thank you scott thank you for joining us and Wish you the best of luck, friend. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. Hey, everybody. I want to thank you for joining us for this episode of Return to Base. That was Scott Deluzio, the author of Surviving Sun and the host of the Drive On podcast. Please go out there and if you're interested, find Surviving Sun wherever you buy your books. Amazon.com's one, obviously, if you can go to his website and buy it directly from him, that's great too. Also encourage everybody to check out his podcast, the drive on podcast. Um, want to thank Scott for really sharing with us some 
some deep material, some very private things that he had go on in his life. Obviously losing a sibling, a fellow soldier is a traumatic experience and really shows how strong Scott is for being able to to talk about his experience for the betterment of of others who might be going through something similar, whether it's a sibling who passed away or a fellow service member, a squad member, a team member. It's really important that, as Scott said, you don't keep it bottled up. You have to talk to somebody. You have to find a community to to draw on, to take comfort in. And he didn't do it alone. And I think he would encourage everybody else not to do it alone if you had the chance. So again, thank you, Scott, for joining us on the podcast and for sharing your story. It was a really great conversation. And hope one day we get to have him on, on the podcast again. Also, if you haven't already, we'd really appreciate it if you followed Better in Life on all the socials. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can find that information on the website. And if you haven't already followed or subscribed to this podcast, in whatever platform you like to listen to your podcast in. We'd really appreciate it if you did that too. Helps out a lot. Until next time, keep carrying on.